Hi, in today's painting we're going to be looking at how to paint dramatic sunsets and their reflections. The location of this scene is Port Macquarie, a lovely town in New South Wales in Australia. The key to this painting is, is obviously the sky. Uh, compositionally there's very little I will change. Um, I like the silhouetted figures on this pier, but primarily we're going to be looking at how to paint this sky and, and the reflections. I use photos as inspiration, and what that means is if I want to change some of the um, shapes, colours uh, in the photo, I feel very um, comfortable with doing that. Anything that improves on the composition is valid. When painting this scene, we paint the light parts of the sky first. In areas where there's going to be dark sky, we will be painting right through that. But I'll have to give some thought to preserving some of these you know, really bright highlights, which in our case will be the white of the paper. Once the underpainting of the sky's totally dried, we'll go in and paint these dark clouds. So let's begin. There's not very much to this drawing, um, other than the figures and the, and the pier. The main thing is to make sure I preserve a lot of space for the sky, because that's the hero of this painting. So we'll draw the distant shoreline, and then we'll draw in the pier. So this is the top railing, this is the, the base of the pier, and there's a side of the pier here. Again, this is not critical, and I'm going to be painting this uh, relatively loosely.
again, I'm more interested in the pattern here rather than being true to the uh, to the image. Actually, we'll put in some these rails. That'll do for the pier. The other thing to add is um, the reflections. So we'll just lightly mark them in now. And reflections are directly below the object you're reflecting. And I always give them a little squiggle to indicate the undulations in the water.
the posts that are further away will will appear closer to the horizon um, than the ones closer to us. So where this post hits the water, it's going to be closer or higher up the paper than this one here, which is on this side. It's not so critical on a shape like this, it's because this is very um, indistinct. And then we've got these figures, so I'll put them in. Obviously this, these smaller figures are, are um, kids. Good. So that's the drawing done. The first step um, in painting this scene will be to wet the back of the paper. Uh, 
and I use lots of water for this. Effectively this process stretches the paper and you end up painting on a very flat surface. As long as the back of the paper stays wet, you don't get any cockling whatsoever. So what I do is I, I run down the board, wetting the back of the paper a couple of times, like that, and um, now I'll leave that there and let it absorb that moisture. And while it's doing that, I'll prepare the colours I'm going to use for my painting. So if we look at the colours, here we've got a slightly dull uh, cobalt blue. Here's cobalt blue that's a little bit brighter. I might also add some cerulean blue to that. Down here we've got cad orange, the Winsor Newton cad orange, with maybe a little bit of burnt sienna in it. And um, in some areas it's just going to be the white of the paper so um, and then obviously because the sun is here we get more warmth more reds and yellows here and then as you move away from that it starts to get lighter in tone and uh, and cooler colors so we need quite a bit of cobalt blue so put that water don't need a lot of the orange, so just a small amount there. It doesn't matter if you overmix at this stage because what you don't use in the sky, you'll use when doing the reflections and the pier. That'll do. Now it's not a bright blue because of the, the time of the day, so I start with the cobalt blue and I'm going to add a little bit of burnt sienna to it and just a hint of the pink which is permanent rose in my case. And you can see um, how as I test this by dragging the brush, pressing just lightly and then dragging the brush this way, this is the actual tone that I've mixed. And this is quite a bit lighter than this part of the painting, this top part. So um, that tells me I have to add more paint. So we'll add more paint, stay away from the water. Pick up a bit more of the pink. A little bit more of burnt sienna. Burnt sienna, because it's an orangey brown, it will grey off the blues because blue and orange are complementary colours. That's getting closer to the tone I want. Um, now I need it just a little bit more blue than that. Again, to create a, a stronger tone, one of the main ways to achieve that is to add more paint into your mixture. Effectively less water and more paint will give you a stronger tone for any particular colour. And that's good. That's good enough for what we want there. This is a size 16 brush, which is handy for mixing. But uh, to create the sort of cloud patterns I want to create, I find a size 12 brush is more to my liking. Um, now I want some nice, well actually I don't need a very bright orange. So this is, this is my cad orange. By the way, all my colours are Winsor Newton colours. It's got some um, impurities on the 
on the top, probably from you know, my previous painting, but that's fine. They'll help just to, to dull this colour, and um, because if you look at the photo in this area here, that's not a bright orange. It really is more of a dull orange. So they're my two main colours. Just to be prepared in case I do need it, I'm going to put some cerulean here. And it'll just save me a few seconds if I have to um, yeah, mix some more. If I've already got it here, it's very easy to add into my um, painting. Okay, there we go. And that's good. This is, this is almost totally flat. You can see how it's um, lifting here a bit. That says it can absorb more moisture. Um, so if I get my bigger brush. For anyone that hasn't um, seen me paint before, and paint this type of scene before. The reason I wet the back is because I discovered that the, the main reason the surface of the paper dries isn't because of evaporation, unless you happen to be painting outside in you know, very hot conditions. Um, but even then, the main reason is that the paper itself absorbs the, um, the moisture, and a bit like blotting paper and then it just leaves a very small amount of moisture at the top and that then evaporates and then when it dries it starts making it very difficult for you to produce some nice clean washes. So now I'll wet the board. This is gator board. It's a semi waterproof board. It's, it's two thin veneers of um, some sort of timber composite sandwiching quite a thick amount of foam core in between. So it absorbs a little bit of the moisture, but it's so, this top layer is so thin, it's probably, you know, less than half a millimeter, or yeah, probably, actually it might be just under one millimeter. So it doesn't absorb a lot of moisture. And, um, and it tends to keep the paper quite workable. Here we go. You do have to be a little bit careful if you've got paint on your board that it doesn't flow around to the front of the paper, or if it does, it only happens in areas where um, you're not too worried. I wasn't that I wasn't being that careful for this because I've got such a dark sky and and the foreground is very dark as well, so it didn't matter if I got a little bit of um, stray colour washing onto this paper. Now, and so the good thing with this technique is not only is the board flat um, and, and it won't cockle unless there's some area that I, I missed out on wetting, you don't need to use tape on it. If it starts to dry, you can always just lift up a section and put some more water underneath. When you touch this, it's, it's cool to touch. So that's what tells you that you've wet it enough. Okay, so let's start. Where I see these light areas, mentally, I'm going to leave some untouched paper there. Areas like this, not so much, um, because I can see some of this warm but very weak orange under, under there, and you'll see how I tackle that. But these areas, I want to try and keep that white on the paper. So that's a more mental exercise. I don't draw the clouds in because I don't like seeing pencil marks in the sky. I don't mind it down here, but not in the sky. But that's a matter of taste. By all means, if you want to draw your clouds in and that makes it easier for you, go right ahead. I'll just hold the brush on the side like this. That helps me create all these lovely broken edges. There we go. Don't press too hard. There we go. Yeah. Again, I'm, I don't necessarily stick to the pattern of clouds and that that are in the um, photo. Um, meaning if there's something I don't quite like, I'll change it. Okay, But if I like it, then I'll put it in. It, it just makes it easier for me. There 
we go. Then as I come in, come lower, these colors are going to be a bit lighter. It's lighter in the distance, so I'll add more water to that paint that's on my brush. And then we'll merge these together. Maybe a little bit more here. I greatly dilute the cat orange mixture for use in these cloud areas. And I'll make sure that I leave some bits of untouched paper. Same up here. Here. And you can see some orange, weak orange, through the, more a beige, I suppose, through the cloud. So I'll put that in, here and there. Blue here. Here I'm just going to just use clean water to soften the transition between the orange and the white. That'll do. I'm going to get a little bit of CAD, oh, sorry not CAD, um, Scarlet Lake here and I'm going to just warm up this sunset a little bit, add a little bit more red down here, maybe a touch there. This is just something I, I do, I think it can, um, if I think a colour or a shape or something can add to the painting, then I'll go ahead and do it. And add it, there we go. Alright, and I'm happy with that as a patent for the uh, starting pattern for this uh, sky. Now I'm going to go and dry this and then um, come back 
and put in the dark clouds. Okay, so this is dry, so I can run my fingers over it and, um, and not disturb the paint, but because you can see how it's starting to, to crinkle up here, that tells me that I need to re-wet the back. Now, I'm going to be a bit more careful this time. I'm going to turn this around and pick up my brush. Just, I don't want water on the front surface, so I'll just run this down like this. So the paper's not totally dry by any means, but this will just add that extra little bit of moisture because in the next stage I'll be doing quite a lot of work on those cloud shapes and it's a lot easier to work on a flat surface. For years, you know, gosh, most of my painting career, I just would just take the paper down and contend with the cockles and the bumps, and, and that's okay once you get the hang of it. But why do that if you can easily work on flatter paper? Here we go. Why I turned my board over is because I knew this side was dry and and I now I want to be careful that I don't get paint on the painting. Carefully lay that down. Right. Just raise that a bit. There we go. When you're painting with watercolours, water is the most important ingredient, so you always have to be aware of what the water is doing. That's not just the water that's in your water container, or in your palette, or on your brush, but also on the paper itself, both the, on the top and underneath. Alright, so now I'm going to go in and paint these dark clouds, and while doing that, I want to make sure I don't lose some of these highlights because they'll, they'll, they'll help to um, make the sky glow. Now this is the blue I had for up here and now I need to mix the dark for the clouds. So I'm just going to add into the blue, I'm going to add some French ultramarine I haven't added any more water, so already I know this is increasing the tone of this mixture. A little bit of burnt sienna. A little bit of the permanent rose. But I don't want it to be too pink. And with permanent rose, um, permanent alizarin, crimson, you have to be, a little bit goes a long way, so you've got to be very careful how much of that you pick up. There we go. Again, here I'll pick up, pick, pick up a lot of paint in my brush. Um, it's almost drippy if I lift it like that. Um, but hold it um, almost parallel to the paper. 
and then as the paint as the paint um, leaves the brush and the brush is just a little bit drier I can start creating some more interesting textures at the edges there we go Again, if you don't wet the back of the paper, you have to use a spray bottle to keep the surface uh, workable. Sometimes I'll take some paint out of my brush so that I'm starting with a drier brush. And that broken edge is created by more of a push stroke rather than a pull stroke. So you push and once you get that initial bulk of the paint off your brush, you're barely touching the paper. I always keep a towel handy if I want to take out some excess moisture, I just tap the, the brush on the towel. Okay, now some parts of this are still drying a bit fast, so I'll just get my spray bottle. I'll hold the spray bottle perpendicular to the paper and press. And that way only the lightest drops land on the surface of my paper. And those light drops are attracted to the wet areas of the paper and they leave the dry area dry. Just clean my brush, pick up some clean water, and then go in and just soften some of these shapes here. In this area of the photo, you see how they're not sh distinct shapes. You can see some of the warmth coming through, but they're soft, primarily soft edges. Uh, 
and I'll get rid of any sort of straight lines that I don't like. Here we've got some very weak clouds. You don't have to put these in, but um, I like I like adding them so add a bit more depth to the painting. Uh, just there. Okay, and then there's some darker passages in here. So what I'm going to do, I've got this paint here. I'm now going to add more paint. I haven't added any more water to that mixture, and that was my original starting mixture for the sky. So because I haven't added any more water, I know that if I add more paint, it's just automatically going to create a much stronger tone. As long as I don't throw in like a yellow or something, which is a natively lighter um, colour. And this passage is all wet on wet. And it's wet because the, pa the, um, the paint I put on there is, is still wet. And I'm looking at this more as an abstract shape, looking for interesting patterns. Here and there, there's some shapes that are a bit lighter. There's a small amount of cockling here, which again tells you I hadn't wet the back enough. Sometimes I'll use the side of the brush, other times the tip, depending on the shape I'm trying to create. There. There. And I look at the photo and I, you know, I see a straight line there, I think, yeah, that'll help the composition, I'll put it in. If I see a mark I don't like, then I'll just leave it out. And that's just about done. Still working to keep that broken edge. I try to remove any lines that look unnatural. Should this bottom of this cloud should be a lot flatter than that. And I'll just give it one more. Just thicken it just a little bit more.
and this is why you have to be aware how wet the surface of your paper is because if this is had dried these I would be creating very different marks here right now there we go And when you put this thicker paint on, you have to be mindful of how much it's going to spread. And you get that with practice, but obviously the thicker the paint, the lower the angle of your board, the less it will spread. So you, um, and you have to put it on while the paper still has quite a bit of shine on it. Um, you can sort of see there. Otherwise, it, it won't flow and you'll end up with lots of unwanted sharp edges there. And this is just about done. There we go. And I think that's a good enough sky. And I'll just lift some excess moisture down here because I don't want that to go any further. These beads of moisture um, what can happen is the paper can dry, you know, the top part of the paper dries, but you're still left with a bead here. And then later, once the, the top section just gets to a certain dampness level, it'll suck that moisture back up and give you what we call cauliflowers because they, they're shapes that look like a cauliflower. There. That'll do. All right, so now, while that's drying, I'm going to um, paint the water. The main thing with the water is that the reflections, the colors you reflect, will always be duller. That's because the colors of the water merge with the colors of whatever it is you're, um, you're reflecting. The colors of these, if these are there's a bright navy blue cloud, it'll be a little bit duller here, right, uh, in the water for that very reason. Now I've just noticed just a small change I want to make to one of these cloud shapes. It's a bit too straight. Now, because I've used all this paint, I'll have to remix some of these colors. But here, this, this orange that I used for up here, I can use that, um, add a little bit of this, this uh, bluish gray color, and that will, that will dull it. Um, in fact, I can start by putting some of that down here. Yeah. We've got this lighter blue, I can use a little bit of that. Because these colours are quite dull and dark anyway, it's not, I don't have to be too accurate with the colour representation. The other important thing is that your reflections have to be below the object you're reflecting. So if you've got light colour here, then it's you have to have light colour underneath it. Okay. Now this is another sharp edge I want to get rid of. A bit too straight, so I'll just just soften that a little bit. There we go. That'll do.
Normally I end up with a lot of sky colour left over, which is so I can quickly use it in the water. But because this, these shapes were so dark, um, that didn't happen this time. Let's, let's get some more. And reflections of dark objects tend to be um, or will be lighter. Again, it's it's a little bit tricky in this case because it's more of a night, semi-nighttime scene. So there's not a lot of light um, in the sky anyway. Because I've got orange in the sky, I've used some of that orange then to help dull this blue. That's better. Good. Again, just get rid of some of this pooled moisture. I just touch the top of that little bead that's sitting there because that, the paint will have settled and the, the top of the bead would just be water. All right, I'll now go and dry that. So now what we have to do is we've got some of these trees and buildings in the distance um, and these are just just dark shapes, right? Um, some of the trees, usually they're Norfolk Island pines, um, these conical shapes. I'll either paint them with my round brush or I can use a fan brush to create that. The main thing is to note how much darker these trees are to the, the clouds above. So, because they're quite small shapes, I'll just use my size eight brush and I've got this mixture here is what I used for here and you can see how it's got to be quite a bit darker
There we go. Now it's probably a bit too strong. I'm going to add some more water, a bit more blue. And I have to remember that some of my darkest colors are going to be in this foreground, so I don't want to go super dark back here either. So let's just establish that shoreline. There we go. So I've just established the shoreline. Then I'll go in and and create the variations. Take out some moisture. There's a bit of a straight line here. There's some sort of building in the distance, but I don't have to throw in any detail. These are different types of bushes, trees. Just drag the brush, just a little bit of moisture, just drag along the surface of the paper and that'll create that broken edge. There we go. Great. Now I might use some of this dark paint and we're going to hint at just some boats in the distance. main thing is have a pointy end and a not so pointy end and vary their size. That'll do. That's just a hint of boats there. It's not critical for this painting and I could have left them out if I wanted to. All right, now we're going to work on the foreground. Let's just make this a little bit thicker, just a little bit more burnt sienna, a bit more French ultramarine. 
Again, I'm not trying to hit a, a black color here. I just want a darker tone, but I use, because I've used some of the colors that are already in the sky, I don't end up with a black. You know, very, very dark, but a slightly uh, bluish sort of tint to it. Now, the, the deck is lighter in tone than these vertical shapes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up some of this paint and move it over into the leftover blue that I had here. And I'm going to just paint that shape. Oops. There we go. There we go. I'll let that sit there for a bit and um, while it's doing that I'm going to mix mix more of this paint because I'm going to need a lot more of it to finish this area and then in a minute I'll um, if, before I paint the rest I'll dry this shape so let's get some more water now we need more paint So this mixture is, is mostly French ultramarine and um, burnt sienna and a little bit of permanent rose. By the way, when I'm painting, um, I stand up when I paint. I know that's not always comfortable for everyone. I like to be able to sort of step back and have a look at the progress of my painting. Um, the only times I sit down when I'm painting is um, when I'm doing workshops and that and I have students looking over my shoulder. Alright, I'm going to very quickly just dry this shape. This, as you can see, this is sort of dried enough that it's lifting off the board, but because I'm only going to be working in this area, I probably can, can um, just get away with wetting the board itself. So we'll see how we go.
it's been poured. Now these boats, give them mass. These trees can be adjusted a little bit. reflection so I'm going to just just put some lines underneath the further away they are the less you're going to see these reflections
ある Might put another figure up here. Even though it's quite late, I'm just going to, you can have a hint of shadows. And I'll just use that to break up this sort of dead flat surface. Just a, just a hint there. Alright, and now, well, before I do the reflection for all of this, um, I'll put a small reflection in for these trees and hills in the distance.
And now we'll do the stronger reflection underneath here. You can see how dark the reflections are underneath the pier. These are some of the darkest darks in the painting. I'm going to um, use the same sort of tone that I've got here for this. And we're going to have reflections to the supports. I'll just give them a little wiggle. Break those lines up a bit. The main thing is they're directly below the objects that are being reflected. And I leave little gaps and that just helps um, represent undulations in the water. Like that. Because you're looking down at the water and it, ref it will be reflecting the underneath of the pier as well, which is quite dark. So that's going to be somewhere in here. So you can see I painted the, the posts, the reflection of the posts, and then I'm going to paint the, ref the other bigger reflections through them. And then we get some ripples coming through. So. Quick strokes. There we go. Now, some of these figures, I'm going to lighten their tops because they're probably wearing a, a white shirt or something, just to give us some variety. A bit of red to this figure just to bring it forward a bit.
There's a little marker in the water here. I don't always put these in, but I, th I thought if someone from the area was looking at this painting, they'd probably say, oh, what about the markers? 